Facts Concerning the Late Arthur Jermyn and His Family by H. P. Lovecraft Life is a hideous thing, and from the background behind what we know of it peer demonical hints of truth which make it sometimes a thousandfold more hideous. Science, already oppressive with its shocking revelations, will perhaps be the ultimate exterminator of our human species, if separate species we be, for its reserve of unguessed horrors would never be borne by mortal brains if loosed upon the world. If we knew what we are, we should do as Sir Arthur Jermyn did. And Arthur Jermyn soaked himself in oil and set fire to his clothing one night. No one placed the charred fragments in an urn or set a memorial to him who had been. For certain papers and a certain boxed object were found which made men wish to forget. Some who knew him do not admit he ever existed. Arthur Jermyn went out on the moor and burned himself after seeing the boxed object which had come from Africa. It was this object, and not his peculiar personal appearance, which made him end his life. Many would have disliked to live if possessed of the peculiar features of Arthur Jermyn, but he had been a poet and scholar and had not minded. Learning was in his blood, for his great-grandfather, Sir Robert Jermyn V.T., had been an anthropologist of note, whilst his great-great-great-grandfather, Sir Wade Jermyn, was one of the earliest explorers of the Congo region and had written eruditely of its tribes, animals, and supposed antiquities. Indeed, old Sir Wade had possessed an intellectual zeal amounting almost to a mania. His bizarre conjectures on a prehistoric white Congolese civilization earning him much ridicule when his book, Observation on the Several Parts of Africa, was published. In 1765, this fearless explorer had been placed in a madhouse at Huntington. Madness was in all the Germans, and people were glad there were not many of them. The line put forth no branches, and Arthur was the last of it. If he had not been, one could not say what he would have done when the object came. The Germans never seemed to look quite right. Something was amiss, though Arthur was the worst, and the old family portraits of German house showed fine faces enough before Sir Wade's time. Certainly the madness began with Sir Wade, whose wild stories of Africa at once were the delight and terror of his few friends. It showed in his collection of trophies and specimens, which were not such as a normal man would accumulate and preserve, and appeared strikingly in the oriental seclusion in which he kept his wife. The latter, he had said, was the daughter of a Portuguese trader whom he had met in Africa, and did not like English ways. She, with an infant son born in Africa, had accompanied him back from the second and longest of his trips, and had gone with him on the third and last, never returning. Nobody had ever seen her closely, not even the servants, for her disposition had been violent and singular. During her brief stay at German House, she occupied a remote wing and was waited on by her husband alone. Sir Wade was indeed most peculiar in his solicitude for his family, for when he returned to Africa, he would permit no one to care for his young son, save a loathsome black woman from Guinea. Upon coming back after the death of Lady German, he himself assumed complete care of the boy. But it was the talk of Sir Wade, especially when he was in his cups, which chiefly led his friends to deem him mad. In a rational age like the 18th century, it was unwise for a man of learning to talk about wild sights and strange scenes under a Congo moon, of the gigantic walls and pillars of a forgotten city crumbling and vine-grown, and of damp, silent stone steps leading interminably down into the darkness of abysmal treasure vaults and inconceivable catacombs. Especially it was unwise to rave of the living things that might haunt such a place, of creatures half of the jungle and half of the impiously aged city, fabulous creatures which even a Pliny might describe with skepticism, things that might have sprung up after the great apes had overrun the dying city with the walls and the pillars, the vaults and the weird carvings. Yet after he came home for the last time, Sir Wade would speak of such matters with a shudderingly uncanny zest mostly after his third glass at the knight's head, boasting of what he had found in the jungle and of how he had dwelt among terrible ruins known only to him. And finally, he had spoken of the living things in such a manner that he was taken to the madhouse. He had shown little regret when shut into the barred room at Huntington, for his mind moved curiously. Ever since his son had commenced to grow out of infancy, he had liked his home less and less, till at last he had seemed to dread it. The knight's head had been his headquarters, and when he was confined, he expressed some vague gratitude as if for protection. Three years later, he died. Wade Jermyn's son Philip was a highly peculiar person. 
Despite a strong physical resemblance to his father, his appearance and conduct were in many particulars so coarse that he was universally shunned. Though he did not inherit the madness that was feared by some, he was densely stupid and given to brief periods of uncontrollable violence. In frame he was small but intensely powerful and was of incredible agility. Twelve years after succeeding to his title, he married the daughter of his gamekeeper, a person said to be of gypsy extraction, but before his son was born, joined the Navy as a common sailor, completing the general disgust which his habits and misalliance had begun. After the close of the American War, he was heard of as a sailor on a merchantman in the African trade, having the kind of reputation for feats of strength in climbing, but finally disappearing one night as the ship lay off the Congo coast. In the son of Sir Philip German, the now accepted family peculiarity took a strange and fatal turn. Tall and fairly handsome, with a sort of weird eastern grace despite certain slight oddities of proportion, Robert German began life as a scholar and investigator. It was he who first studied scientifically the vast collection of relics in which his mad grandfather had brought from Africa, and who made the family name as celebrated in ethnology as an exploration. In 1815, Sir Robert married the daughter of the seventh Viscount Brightholm, and was subsequently blessed with three children, the eldest and youngest of whom were never publicly seen on account of deformities of mind and body. Saddened by these family misfortunes, the scientists sought relief in work and made two long expeditions in the interior of Africa. In 1849, his second son, Neville, a singularly repellent person who seems to combine the surliness of Philip German with the hauteur of the Bright Homes, ran away with a vulgar dancer, but was pardoned upon his return in the following year. He came back to German House a widower with an infant son, Alfred, who was one day to be the father of Arthur German. Friends said it was this series of griefs which unhinged the mind of Sir Robert German, yet it was probably merely a bit of African folklore which caused the disaster. The elderly scholar had been collecting legends of the Unga tribes near the field of his grandfather's and his own explorations, hoping in some way to account for Sir Wade's wild tales of a lost city occupied by strange hybrid creatures. A certain consistency in the strange papers of his ancestor suggested that the madman's imagination might have been stimulated by native myths. On October 19, 1852, the explorer Samuel Seton called at German House with a manuscript of notes collected among the Ungas, believing that certain legends of a gray city of white apes ruled by a white god might prove valuable to the ethnologist. In his conversation, he probably supplied many additional details, the nature of which will never be known, since a hideous series of tragedies suddenly burst into being. When Sir Robert German emerged from his library, he left behind the strangled corpse of the explorer, and before he could be restrained, he put an end to all three of his children, the two who were never seen and the son who had run away. Neville German died in the successful defense of his own two-year-old son, who had apparently been included in the old man's madly murderous scheme. Sir Robert himself, after repeated attempts at suicide and a stubborn refusal to utter an articulate sound, died of apoplexy in the second year of his confinement. Sir Alfred German was a baronet before his fourth birthday, but his taste never matched his title. At twenty, he had joined a band of music hall performers, and at thirty-six, he had deserted his wife and child to travel with an itinerant American circus. His end was very revolting. Among the animals in the exhibition with which he traveled was a huge bull gorilla of lighter color than the average, a surprisingly tractable beast of much popularity with the performers. With this gorilla, Alfred German was singularly fascinated, and on many occasions the two would eye each other for long periods through the intervening bars. Eventually, German asked and obtained permission to train the animal, astonishing audiences and fellow performers alike with his success. One morning in Chicago, as the gorilla and Alfred German were rehearsing an exceedingly clever boxing match, the former delivered a blow of more than the usual force, hurting both the body and the dignity of the amateur trainer. Of what followed, members of the greatest show on earth do not like to speak. They did not expect Sir Alfred German to emit a shrill, inhuman scream, or see him seize his clumsy antagonist with both hands, dash it to the floor of the cage, and bite fiendishly at its hairy throat. The gorilla was off its guard, but not for long, and before anything could be done by the regular trainer, 
the body which had belonged to a baronet was past recognition. Arthur Jerman was the son of Sir Alfred Jerman and a music hall singer of unknown origin. When the husband and father deserted the family, the mother took the child to Jerman House, where there was none left to object to her presence. She was not without notions of what a nobleman's dignity should be, and saw to it that her son received the best education which limited money could provide. The family resources were now sadly slender, and Jerman House had fallen into woeful disrepair, but young Arthur loved the old edifice and all its contents. He was not like any other Jerman who had ever lived, for he was a poet and a dreamer. Some of the neighboring families who had heard tales of old Sir Wade Jerman's unseen Portuguese wife declared that her Latin blood must be showing itself, but most persons merely sneered at his sensitiveness to beauty, attributing it to his music hall mother, who was socially unrecognized. The poetic delicacy of Arthur Jerman was the more remarkable because of his uncouth personal appearance. Most of the Germans had possessed a subtly odd and repellent cast, but Arthur's case was very striking. It is hard to say just what he resembled, but his expression, his facial angle, and the length of his arms gave a thrill of repulsion to those who met him for the first time. It was the mind and character of Arthur Jerman which atoned for his aspect. Gifted and learned, he took highest honors at Oxford and seemed likely to redeem the intellectual fame of his family. Though a poetic rather than scientific temperament, he planned to continue his work of his forefathers in African ethnology and antiquities, utilizing the truly wonderful though strange collection of Sir Wade. With his fanciful mind, he thought often of the prehistoric civilization in which the mad explorer had so implicitly believed, and would weave tale after tale about the silent jungle city mentioned in the latter's wilder notes and paragraphs. For the nebulous utterances concerning a nameless, unsuspected race of jungle hybrids, he had a peculiar feeling of mingled terror and attraction speculating on the possible basis of such a fancy and seeking to obtain light amongst the more recent data gleaned by his great-grandfather and Samuel Seton amongst the Ungas. In 1911, after the death of his mother, Sir Arthur Jerman determined to pursue his investigations to the utmost extent. Selling a portion of his estate to obtain the requisite money, he outfitted an expedition and sailed for the Congo. Arranging with the Belgian authorities for a party of guides, he spent a year in the Unga and Khan country finding data beyond the highest of his expectations. Among the Kalaris was an aged chief named Mwanu, who possessed not only a highly retentive memory, but a singular degree of intelligence and interest in old legends. This ancient confirmed every tale which Jeremy had heard, adding his own account of the stone city and the white apes as it had been told to him. According to Moana, the gray city and the hybrid creatures were no more, having been annihilated by the warlike Nabangos many years ago. This tribe, after destroying most of the edifices and killing the lie beings, had carried off the stuffed goddess which had been the object of their quest. The white ape goddess, which the strange beings worshipped, and which was held by Congo tradition to be the form of one who had reigned as a princess among these beings. Just what the white ape-like creatures could have been, Moano had no idea, but he thought they were the builders of the ruined city. Jerman could form no conjecture, but by close questioning it obtained a very picturesque legend of the stuffed goddess. The ape princess, it was said, became the consort of a great white god who had come out of the west. For a long time they had reigned over the city together, but when they had a son, all three went away. Later, the god and princess had returned, and upon the death of the princess, her divine husband had mummified the body and enshrined it in a vast house of stone where it was worshipped. Then he departed alone. The legend here seemed to present three variants. According to one story, nothing further happened save that the stuffed goddess became a symbol of supremacy for whatever tribe might possess it. It was for this reason that the Nabangos carried it off. A second story told of the god's return and the death at the feet of his enshrined wife. A third told of the return of the sun, grown to manhood, or apehood, or godhood, as the case might be, yet unconscious of his identity. Surely the imaginative blacks had made the most of whatever events might lie behind the extravagant legendary. Of the reality of the jungle city described by old Sir Wade, Arthur German had no further doubt, and was hardly astonished when early in 1912 he came upon what was left of it. Its size must have been exaggerated, yet the stories lying about proved that it was no mere Negro village. 
Unfortunately, no carvings could be found, and the small size of the expedition prevented operations for clearing the one visible passageway that seemed to lead down into the system of vaults which Sir Wade had mentioned. The white apes and the stuffed goddess were discussed with the native chiefs of the region, but it remained for a European to improve on the data offered by old Moanu. Monsieur Verheret, Belgian agent at a trading post in the Congo, believed he could not only locate but obtain the stuffed goddess of which he had vaguely heard. Since the once mighty Nabangos were now the submissive servants of King Albert's government, and with but little persuasion could be induced to part with the gruesome deity they had carried off. When Jeremy sailed for England, therefore, it was with the exalted probability that he would, within a few months, receive a priceless ethnological relic confirming the wildest of his great-great-great-grandfather's narratives, that is, the wildest which he had ever heard. Countrymen near German House have perhaps heard wilder tales handed down from ancestors who had listened to Sir Wade around the tables of the Knight's Head. Arthur Jermyn waited very patiently for the expected box from Monsieur Verheron, meanwhile studying with increased diligence the manuscripts left by his mad ancestor. He began to feel closely akin to Sir Wade and to seek relics of the latter's personal life in England as well as of his African exploits. Oral accounts of the mysterious and secluded wife had been numerous, but no tangible relic of her stay at German House remained. German wondered what circumstance had prompted or permitted such an effacement, and decided that the husband's insanity was the prime cause. His great-great-great-grandmother, he recalled, was said to have been the daughter of a Portuguese trader in Africa. No doubt her practical heritage and superficial knowledge of the Dark Continent had caused her to flout Sir Wade's tales of the interior, a thing which such a man would not be likely to forgive. She had died in Africa, perhaps dragged hither by a husband determined to prove what he had told. But as Jeremy indulged in these reflections, he could not but smile at their futility a century and a half after the death of both his strange progenitors. In June 1913, a letter arrived from Monsieur Verheron telling of the finding of the stuffed goddess. It was, as the Belgian appeared, a most extraordinary object, an object quite beyond the power of a layman to classify. Whether it was human or simian, only a scientist could determine, and the process of determination would be greatly hampered by its imperfect condition. Time and the Congo climate are not kind to mummies, especially when their preparation is as amateurish as seemed to be the case here. Around the creature's neck had been found a golden chain bearing an empty locket on which there were armorial designs. No doubt some hapless traveler's keepsake taken by the Nabangos and hung upon the goddess as a charm. In commenting on the contour of the mummy's face, Monsieur Verheron suggested a whimsical comparison, or rather expressed a humorous wonder just how it would strike his correspondent, but was too much interested scientifically to waste many words on levity. The stuffed goddess, he wrote, would arrive duly packed about a month after the receipt of the letter. The boxed object was delivered at German House on the afternoon of August 3, 1913, being conveyed immediately to the large chamber which housed the collection of African specimens as arranged by Sir Robert and Arthur. What ensued can best be gathered from the tales of servants and from things and papers later examined. Of the various tales, that of aged Soames, the family butler, is the most ample and coherent. According to this trustworthy man, Sir Arthur Jermyn dismissed everyone from the room before opening the box, though the incessant sound of hammer and chisel showed that he did not delay the operation. Nothing was heard for some time, just how long Soames cannot exactly estimate, but it was certainly less than a quarter of an hour later that a horrible scream, undoubtedly in Jermyn's voice, was heard. Immediately afterward, Jermyn emerged from the room, rushing frantically towards the front of the house, as if pursued by some hideous enemy. The expression on his face, a face ghastly enough in repose, was beyond description. When near the front door, he seemed to think of something, and then turned back in his flight, finally disappearing down the stairs to the cellar. The servants were utterly dumbfounded and watched at the head of the stairs, but their master did not return. A smell of oil was all that came up from the regions below. After dark, a rattling was heard at the door leading from the cellar into the courtyard, and a stable boy saw Arthur Jermyn glistening from head to foot with oil and redolent with that fluid, steal furtively out and vanish into the black moor surrounding the house. Then, in an exultation of supreme horror, everyone saw the end. A spark appeared on the moor, a flame arose and a pillar of human fire reached to the heavens. The House of Jermyn no longer existed.
The reason why Arthur Jermyn's charred fragments were not collected and buried lies in what was found afterward, principally the thing in the box. The stuffed goddess was a nauseous sight, withered and eaten away, but it was clearly a mummified white ape of some unknown species, less hairy than any recorded variety, and infinitely nearer to mankind, quite shockingly so. Detailed description would be rather unpleasant, but two salient particulars must be told for they fit in revoltingly with certain notes of Sir Wade Jerman's African expeditions and with the Congolese legends of the White God and Ape Princess. The two particulars in question are these. The arms in the golden locket about the creature's neck were the German arms, and the jocose suggestion of Monsieur Verheron about certain resemblances connected with the shriveled face applied with vivid, ghastly, and unnatural horror to none other than the sensitive Arthur Jerman the great-great-great-grandson of Sir Wade Jerman and an unknown wife. Members of the Royal Anthropological Institute burned the thing and threw the locket into a well, and some of them do not admit that Arthur Jerman ever existed. <laughs>